the original talk was called, as you can see, by land, by sea, and by air. But literally, I'm not kidding, probably like 72 hours ago, this is like Monday or Tuesday, I think we're on Thursday now. Monday night, myself, Jesse, and a couple of the other guys. Oh, you rock. Thank you. Are they closing that one, or are they going to keep that one open? <laughs> I can see through it, but it's beer. You rock. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> so, we're sitting there. Monday evening, and we're talking about lasers, because we have a couple of lasers in the office, and we wanted bigger lasers. Bigger laser equals big power. So in Denver, there's a, the Geological Society, or whoever it is, has got a nuclear reactor. <laughs> Gets better. Has got a nuclear reactor in the middle of, in the middle of, somewhere in the middle of Denver, there's a nuclear, we actually found out where it was. But the problem is this bloody thing's like 40 or 50 years old. So like it's probably, warranty's probably run out by now. So we're like, we need power. How do we get power? So and a little bit of this talk is about how we get power. But we started talking about you know, getting power out of reactors. And we figured that most of the reactors, there's a couple of good reactors, we figured about reactors and power. And then somebody looked at me, they're like, you're being the evil genius. I'm like, no, 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 I'm being me. They're like, no, what you're building is the evil lair. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 maybe yes. So all of you, hopefully, can at least recognize one or more of the evil layers. So despite the fact this talk is by land, by sea, by air, what I'm actually going to be talking about is how to build your own evil layer. Because, quite honestly, I think I've kind of gone rogue to some degree. We will put a shopping list together for your evil layer. We're actually going to go through a, a recap of 2011 as well. How we're going to do it, which makes relevant to a business side of things, is we're going to talk about OSINT. We're going to talk about digital footprinting. OSINT, how many of you guys know what OSINT is? Most, some, none. Okay. Open source intelligence gathering. Okay. Human, human intelligence gathering. You can also do social engineering for the same thing. But the OSINT side of the world is literally finding out what data is already out there. This is not you having to hack into an airplane, although that actually helps with some of this stuff. But it is actually going out and then going, I want to hack into an airplane. How the bloody hell am I going to do this? What tools do I need? What is the architecture? What are the systems? How do we do this? And so we'll work our way through this. You will have to probably excuse me. Some of the slides are kind of out of sequence. I'll be messing around with it, because originally this was a fairly dry talk. And then I rearranged the whole bloody thing to actually deal with evil layers. We will talk about boats and missiles and power. Missiles are fun. Um, <laughs> boats were fun. We had fun with boats in Norway. And then some to do, some things to think about. And then for me, actually, some stuff that we're working on a little bit more for like next year or whenever, if I don't get invited back again. So anyway, as an evil genius, this is the shopping list. We need wheels. Oh, Hugh Rock, he already brought me one as well. So now I've got two. You, I absolutely adore. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. I'm going to have this too. So as an evil genius, I need wheels. Obviously, once I've trampled on my minions, I need to be able to just roll over the top of them. I need long distance transportation, planes. We obviously need the boats. Typically, as everybody knows, the evil lair is on a disused bloody, under a disused volcano in the middle of an island somewhere. How the smeg do you get to it? We obviously, you know, we need the missiles. For crying out loud, we need lots of missiles. How many of you guys have seen Despicable Me? Good continually moving, sodding missiles. Again, this is the reason we need power. You need the power to build the bloody missiles. You need the raw materials, but we'll ignore that one for this one. We need the location. We need the minions. We haven't solved this one yet. I haven't quite figured out how to clone minions or do anything else with this one. So we're going to have some talks to minions. Now, again, the second realization, this is going to cost a smeg, an absolutely smegging huge amount of money, unless we can find a different way of doing this. You also, so we discovered, cannot walk into a military base and go, hello, the Pac-3 over there. Could I possibly just borrow it for a little while? They don't like that. We actually did call up. We called up the Pentagon, asking if we could buy, buy it. It was great. We went through to the procurement department of the Pentagon and said, we'd like to buy a Patriot missile, please. We have an Amex. It has a good land of clearance on it. They wouldn't let us buy one. I've got the telephone number in case anybody tries to do it. 
Plan B, intelligence gathering, OSINT, open source intelligence, and then digital footprint. And as it says at the bottom, remember this. This is relatively important the whole way through this talk and the fun stuff that we have. So what is it? It is a trail. It's a trail that's left by the target's interactions with the internet. You as your organizations or organizations you're targeting or you represent have IT people. You might be IT people yourselves. How often do you go to an open forum? How often do you go to the Cisco forum, the listserv forums, the Oracle, the, the Cisco, wherever it might be, and go, hi, I have a problem. I need help with my problem. And then somebody else helpful on the forum goes, hi, we'll help you. Just post the config. And people do. The database that we maintain, so Al has a fun little database that we maintain, has about four, 500,000 Cisco configs in it. Most without the bloody password encrypted. I haven't got to break into the damn company when they post the information out there themselves. That doesn't include all the other stuff, and some of it will go into it. And again, for, re for reference, we're going to skip by that slide. <sighs> Simple stuff. This is stuff. Do a quick show of hands if you guys don't mind. How many of you are, are in the security, the pen testing side of things? Hopefully, this all makes sense to you guys. If it doesn't, start adding this to the arsenal. And it isn't just about the social side of it. It's everywhere. From an organization standpoint, even a simple open quote at my company or my company, the target .com, close quotes, SQL, error code, Cisco, whatever you might want to put in there, helps understand what data has already leaked out. For that, you will need spiders. You will also need to pick your target correctly. <laughs> the left-hand side, top left-hand side is Jesse. I was actually going to try and get him out here this year, because quite honestly, I'm blaming him for a lot of this. He's an extremely good friend of mine. He is also probably one of the best engineers I know to mankind. You know what? I didn't go through the slideshow and tell it not to move on. So I'm going to have to run back every now and again. Anyway, unhackable stuff. Simple stuff. Easy stuff. But the stuff that is hackable. Let's make sure this one doesn't actually move on. So the stuff that we know we can take out. Take a tractor or a combine harvester. Basically 50, half a million to a million lines of code. Right hand side, modern aviation systems. Five to seven million lines of code. I'm going to shoot the computer. I love my Mac, but it's going to have a freaking bullet hole in it in a minute. Day, no walkies. Modern aviation, five to seven-ish million lines of code, not including the entertainment system. Look at the vehicles, 100 million-ish lines of code. That is a huge amount of data. And how much of it's got errors in it? These are my targets. These are the targets we're looking at. There's also a distinct possibility we're looking at these things as well. We're looking at the missiles because we want a missile, because we can't buy one and we can't take one away. So we're going to figure out how to actually use one of the damn things. We go into it in depth. It's fun. But again, putting it into perspective, that one single E-Class Mercedes has more bloody code in it than you know, 15, 20 flipping F-35s. You want to start looking at targets and things to break? Those are fun ones to play with. Plus, they're readily accessible, and they don't cost billions of dollars if you crash one. So, shopping list. Um, we're going to run, literally run through this one because I did this last year and I don't really want to repeat it too much and we've got a lot of other stuff to, carry, uh, to go through. Are you guys, are we recording this again this year? Yeah? Okay, cool. If we're not, I can get a copy of the slides. Give me a card, get hold of mine, hit me up on Twitter, something along those lines. I'll get a copy of them out if necessary. Cards. So, we're going to go through, we'll do an update. We did this last year. We started looking at basically the CAN bus system, the Autosar system, the moist network architecture. How do the vehicles work? How are the architectures work? How can we as individuals interact with those architectures? I'm going to leave it on this one because this is the one we actually need. So what do we use to interface with them? Top left hand side, Bluetooth. It's a simple Linksys, USB T1000, I think, for crying out loud. Or go get yourself an Uber 2. Going to shoot the laptop. Stay. No walkies. All right, I might actually stop this in a second and see if I can actually figure out how to actually not let it do this. 
So the tools that we use, I think Ubertooth's on there as well. Go get yourself an Ubertooth, get yourself a Bluetooth driver. Again, your target for the stuff that we're looking at are the vehicles that have Bluetooth enabled. Um, the stuff that we're doing on this one in particular, uh, we have, the one example we have on this one is we started messing around with a couple of the new, these are all commercial tools. So you don't actually have to go out and crack tools. You can use basically the injection tools that are in there, the auto ingenuity tools in there, the CAN RS232 tools in there, the CAN tool stuff in there. This is all commercially available stuff. And this is, all right, give me a sec, guys. I'm actually going to try and adjust this and see if we can actually get it so it doesn't keep skipping ahead because otherwise I might have to shoot it. Transition. After 15 seconds, no, on mass click. Flight full slides. All right, keep your fingers crossed. All right. So a lot of what I'm going to show you, as well as, as well as talking about the OSINT side and digital footprinting, in this particular case, what we ended up doing was using um, the USB tool. And we'll talk you through it on the next one. So obviously, you have to find your target. You have to go fishing for your target. In this case, we did it this weekend. We redid some work this weekend. Um, simple architecture. Really, you need yourself a spectrograph analyzer. Because obviously, as your target comes into range, you need to understand, is it running Bluetooth? Nice little bump in the middle tells you that the vehicle in question is running Bluetooth. You now have a window of opportunity to make friends with said car if it's not yours. Obviously, from a legal standpoint, we, only, uh, we would recommend you practice on your own vehicle. What you choose to do in your own time is entirely up to you. Um, I think two years ago, I made a statement about the fact that the presidential cavalcade would make an amazingly good target, but I think they fixed the problems now. <laughs> Romney's bus was still running Bluetooth as of two weeks ago, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to get yelled at. So anyway, get your target. You will run into the first thing on the vehicles. You'll run into the, hi, we need a four-digit pin code fuzz it, break it, or write your own code, or even go online. There's a bunch of places where you can basically get Bluetooth fuzzes or four, four passcode fuzzes. You're basically brute forcing a four-digit pin code. No different than the fairly easy way to brute force a four-digit pin code on an ATM card. Needless to say, that can be done pretty instantaneously now. Write yourself a quick program. It's fairly easy to do. In doing so, you now have associated with a aforementioned vehicle. Now that you've associated with a vehicle, what you now have to do is figure out how to get from the entertainment system to the main CAN bus network. There are a few ways of doing this. Again, I will go back to the OSINT world, and I will go back to you guys and encouraging you guys to start looking at the CAN bus architecture. But once you can do that, you can get yourself the CAN232 software, or you can get yourself another nice piece of software which will actually look at the PID ID. So now you can watch the PID ID architecture. You've actually got to put the vehicle in maintenance mode, which in the Volvo in particular will go in maintenance mode while the still, thing's still driving. This particular Volvo we did over the weekend, it wasn't one of ours, I have to admit. Um, and we actually have, we've got the engine speed, engine throttle position, and engine fuel rate. So we helped the person with their Volvo and shut off half the cylinders. Helps fuel economy. So this was in Oslo. This was this February. So you've got Zoz, myself, Render, and a bunch of other guys walking down the high street in Oslo. And we recognized that each one of the blasted taxis was a Mercedes. And I'm walking down there, and Zoz is like giggling. And I'm like, what? And he shows me the Bluetooth interface. So needless to say, I rise to the occasion. We fire up the Bluetooth system. We realize that it's Oslo fishing. I have the Mac code on this thing. I have this side of it. And now I actually know exactly how to attack the vehicle. I fire up Backtrack that gives me some of the Bluetooth tools I need to get into the system. And at that point in time, I have my Bluetooth antenna. I convert Bluetooth, or the, the Auto Ingenuity tool is an RS-232 tool. RS-232, you can convert into a Bluetooth side of things. It then starts to talk to the Mercedes, and we put them all in neutral. We took it about two minutes per Mercedes to do this. It was quite fun to do. Now, in case you need the Mercedes CAN bus PID IDs, here they are. They're on a nice spreadsheet. If you go out to Google, you can find them. The nice thing about this one is about halfway down here. I'm not sure how legible it is. About halfway down here, it actually gives you the entire PID ID to put the vehicle into neutral. 
So you inject that in, and all of a sudden the Mercedes goes. The driver's like, what the fuck is happening? Simple. Do some OSINT. Do some digital footprinting. This is actually pulled off of some public stuff that's out there. It's easy to do, guys. So needless to say, as the bad guys, we figured out the cars. I really want to know if that's running Bluetooth. Buses. Again, this is from last year, although we updated it because we went out to Oslo and we made friends with the Oslo transit system. I'm probably never going to get invited back there again. Those are actually photographs we took before we got on the bus and stopped the bus from running. We got off the bus because we couldn't get it running again. <laughs> yeah, let's not go there. Again, open source intelligence. There is actually a website in Canada that tells you exactly what the transit fleet is running, what the fleet number is, who the manufacturer, what the engine is, what the transmission is. You can find this information out. You can then go out there and go, I need software for this engine. I need to interface with this engine. I need to understand how to talk to this engine. And then when you understand how to talk with the engine, you can sit at a coffee shop, in this case in Denver. You can sit at the coffee shop in Denver. You can fire up your wireless access point. From the wireless access point that you've borrowed possibly an SSID key from the main transit system, you can associate with the bus as it spends five minutes waiting there. You can make friends with the system. You can actually fire up the, hang on, whose software do we use for this one? Cummings, the Cummings Insight software. And then once you have the Cummings Insight software, you can now adjust the RPMs. You can adjust the speed limiter. So if the bus isn't turning up on time, you can now mess with the speed limiter on the bus. Perfect. Public transit. So we have the buses sorted as well. Planes. Did I talk about planes last year? I think I did, didn't I? Guess what? They still haven't fixed many of the problems. In fact, I had a really nice conversation with somebody in here earlier on who walked up to me and said, hey, there's problems with the Tomcat and the Apache on the planes, and I just started giggling. So we did this last year, but again, it comes down to research. It comes down to knowing that Boeing doesn't build airplanes. Boeing gets 100 other companies around and goes, we're all going to build an airplane. It's like Lego. Each one of those hundred companies goes away and publishes on the website, woohoo, we're building an airplane. Those become your targets. No different than if you are working against your client. Your client has engaged you to attack them. Do you walk into the front door and go, hello, I'm here? You can do that, and it actually works. But you can also go through the side door. And the side door being their vendors. No different than this. So with the airplane, we'll go through the example again. You find out who makes the airplane systems. You target the system you want, in this case, the IntelliBus architecture. For that, you have to actually find out what the API is. For the API architecture, you go out to the third-party company, and you can download the VxWorks environment that allows you to communicate with the IntelliBus architecture. You, on your own system, have made yourself a self-contained VX environment that can communicate with the IntelliBus system. You've had to do some bloody research for it, and you've had to figure out exactly how it works. But when you've done it, what you now have is the ability to create yourself a crate. And in this case, it was a crate for a 787 that we made that basically shut the engines off using the FADEC chip architecture at 35,000 feet. Loves, hugs, and kisses, one world labs. Needless to say, they have fixed some of these issues. But having sitting on an airplane going over to Norway and actually sitting on a 737 going down to San Antonio on Tuesday, um, we made friends with the firewall. We overrode the firewall and we made friends with the second firewall. Once we're on the second firewall, we run into an Apache Tomcat sitting on 1433. It's not patched. Have fun with it. <laughs> Carefully. <laughs> okay? Simple stuff. It takes a little bit of work. It takes you coming a little prepared. It means you're going onto an airplane with a machine that's you know, capable of having some fun with their environments. How many of you guys fly on the planes that have the GoGo wireless running on them? I challenge you, next time you're on the airplane that has GoGo wireless, see how far through the firewall you can get. See if you can get to the ground-based communication that they use. See if you can get to the IntelliBus architecture. Please don't take the airplane out of the sky. 
And for those of you who are in the airline industry listening to this, fix it, please. These are problems that we've highlighted for the last year or two. This is stuff we've brought up for a while now, same as the cars, the vehicle stuff we've brought up for several years. Now, I know that the cycle they have for fixing stuff is extended, but it would be nice to actually know that this stuff's being done. Because the same things you can do with airplanes, you can do with drones as well. And the same guys who do the work with the airplanes, the L7 guys, the Lockheed guys, the Boeing guys, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are all leaking tons of data about the drones and the ADSB. Did any of you guys go to DEF CON this year, or did any of you guys catch Render's uh, talk or the University of Texas talk where they actually took over the drones and had fun with them? <laughs> this is a follow-on from that. We're actually going to see if we can have fun with the ADSB architecture in the next couple of months. All, again, through OSINT. The ability to now control the system. So, we have planes, we have drones. So let's take a look at the shopping list. Well, if we go back to it, we need to actually start looking at the floating things. We need a ship. So this was Oslo again earlier this year. And I'm sitting on the quayside. And I've got a wireless antenna running, and I'm just making friends with whoever's around. And I notice that a couple of wireless access points keep on coming in and disappearing off on a fairly cyclical basis. And I realize it's the bloody ships. I'm like, they got free Wi-Fi for people. But they don't. Their wireless access points are actually for their internal systems. <laughs> So, if you can actually get one of the damn things to stay still for more than five minutes and actually stay within wireless range, you can very quickly, very simply, and very easily, with the use of Backtrack and a few other things, gain access to their wireless network, crack the key that it's running. It's web. It doesn't take very long to crack the damn web key. And now I'm on their network. So all I do is I run a quick scan across the network. We find the engine management software. It's running RDP on 3389. <laughs> It takes about two minutes to crack the administration password. It's a derivative of the company that's running the ships. So now we're sitting on the engine management system, at which point we actually stop the engines. Again, you know, we're trying to be ecologically friendly. <laughs> so we're doing this. At this point in time, we've actually got our host from uh, HackCon out there, and he's asking us what we're doing. We're like, see the ship? He's like, you cannot do that. We just did. You shouldn't do that. We just did. Start it up again. Working on it. <laughs> again, guys, this is, sim this is, we're not talking about doing a huge amount of recoding. You know, you, you're having to know how to use the tools in Backtrack or, or any of the other stuff. This is pretty simple stuff, guys, and it's kind of fun stuff. At this point in time, we have our ship. Did you see that they auctioned this thing off earlier this year? It's really sad. We put a bid in for the auction because we wanted to keep it in one piece, but they wouldn't let us. I have no idea why. So, so far, we have our wheels, we have our buses, we have our planes, we have our boats. We need to move on to the other stuff. But, I think before we do, let's talk about OSIN. Yeah, let's not talk about OSIN. So, we're going to take a pause. We'll take a look at OSINT for a second. Really, the old stuff that we were doing, and it's old, but it's still bloody valid, and it's still being done a lot, and it's a perfect way into an organization, human, human intelligence gathering, as well as social engineering. Again, those of you who are in the red team or are pen testing or helping organizations to understand this, this is something that needs to be looked at. But again, the SIGINT side of it and the OSINT side of it, there is a huge amount of information that is out there that we tend to ignore. Organizations put a lot of data out there, partly because they have to, but partly because they don't realize it's being put out there. Their own internal guys put it out. Their own internal systems put it out. And these things don't bloody catch it. Your firewall, your IDS, your IPS, your host intrusion isn't going to catch the fact that your Cisco guy has just been socially engineered into putting the bloody config out on an open Cisco forum or that the AS400 guy is putting stuff on a list serve. These are tools that you can use as part of a pen test. So, stop bloody using them. Because I'm part English, I'd like to have a go at the French. The channel tunnel was, well, the channel was built for a reason, and some silly sod actually put a bloody tunnel underneath it. So, a good example, difference between reactive and proactive. 
reactive. You guys know what the Maginot line is? Absolutely awesome piece of engineering. Gorgeous, amazing, more concrete used in that than I care to think of. And it pointed in one bloody direction. Germany. Now the Germans, being the sneaky chaps that they were back then, went, huh, we're not going to go through that. So they went rounded and over the damn thing, thereby rendering it pretty useless. That's the firewall of the organization that you are pen testing. You have other options. Use them. Start looking, even at yourselves, what data is out there, what public data, what private data, who's crawling it, who's looking at it. Help your clients understand their data, that the footprint they have. Part of the reason is, and I told the semantic guys I was going to do this, and I apologize kind of in advance, but about a year, year and a half ago, to semantics credit, they put their hand up and said, hey, we lost data. The problem is that data had been out in the wild for an extended period of time. We actually had a client that we worked with pretty heavily, and we still work with them on a monthly basis, who, who uses the service. We found it. It was being published. It was actually being bought, sold, and bloody traded. So we told our client. Our client took a look at it, took a risk analysis of it, and shut down a bunch of their semantic systems, thereby saving them the headache of a bunch of zero-day exploits. Help the organizations you work for or that you are attacking understand what their risks are. I'm going to leave. Well, we'll talk about that one for a second. The engine. You guys can do the simple stuff. You can go out to Google. You can do the open quotes at mycompany.com and all the other stuff. You can build yourself your own environments. We tend to use Lucene. We use Nutch. We use Solar and various other things. We do a lot of crawling and a lot of indexing. It's all out there, guys. This is fairly simple stuff. And you can start messing around with heuristics on here as well. The challenge that you have to do as you are making sense of the internet is to figure out the difference between basically I'm hacked off with IBM and I'm hacking into IBM. Contextualize the searches that you have. Understand how the search queries and the search architecture and the search engines work. The second and third bullet points are the stuff that we're messing around with. Trying to figure out what the SMEG hacked is in you know, Russian versus Iranian and Iraqi is kind of interesting. And then the various options. But again, this is stuff that's out there, guys. So back to fun stuff. Missiles. Again, obviously, how many of you guys have seen The Dictator? You know, really standing at the front going, we're making it for peaceful uses? Obviously, missiles for peaceful uses. As an evil genius, I have to have my missiles, obviously, for a deterrent. I obviously will never use them in an offensive cast at all, but I have to have them. Now, as an individual inside the continental United States, unfortunately, we can't just go out there and ask for missiles. So we have to do research. We have to actually start to look at these things and go, well, I want to have a look at a missile. I want to figure out what's going on with missiles. In this case, we actually decided to split it into two ways. We obviously need the missile for, for, for ground-based communications and attacks. But just like uh, a lot of the stuff in, um, I was going to say, Star Wars, change bond. You know, they get up into the space on a regular basis. We decided we needed a couple of space missiles as well. So if you notice on here, we actually have the ground support equipment, the launch vehicle, the space crane bus, and the payload. Um, we actually have all the code behind the scenes for this thing. And um, yeah, there's some fun stuff with missile launching as well. Mm. This was good. Uh, this was VNC. A VNC 3.3 exploit got us into this. Really nice. So we'll talk about these for a minute. Again, we go back to missiles. Wiley Coyote. He can phone a pack me. He can get a box, it's delivered, it has a missile in it. We can't do the same. We actually have to approach it a little differently. First, we actually have to figure out what we want. So our acquisition. In this case, we went after the Patriot missile. We started to look at where they were, how to get them, what the architecture was, and who made the damn things. In doing so, we did some research. I don't know how legible this is, but there's an IP address, a username, and a password, and a host name for a database. The nice thing about this database is it was made public. It gave us the entire shopping list for a Patriot missile. <laughs> we actually called up the Pentagon again, and then we gave them the entire shopping list and said, can we buy the individual components? At which point, men in black suits turned up at the office and started asking all sorts of questions. 
How y'all doing? <laughs> Wonderful. And yourself? <laughs> So we started to look at this thing. It's like, okay, how can we, without actually going and buying one of these things, how can we take control of one? Again, you can't walk in, kick the door down, and push the button where you want it. But what you can start to do is start to look at how these things have guidance control systems. Start to influence, potentially, the guidance control architecture. To that point, we started to look at all the vendors. All the vendors and the systems they had, all the vendors in the programming, the Python, the Irix, all these other things that they used. The companies that made the individual components. We know the fuel, we know all this information, we knew exactly how to control the motors on these things. But what we hadn't figured out until we looked on the patent office was exactly how the guidance control system worked. So, thank you very much patent office. An extremely good source of information, should you ever need it. I highly recommend using it for buses, cars, trains, airplanes, missiles, <laughs> nuclear submarines. <laughs> it's great. So at this point in time, I know exactly what. I want the guidance control processor. Now, the nice thing about having the parts list, I know exactly now who makes the guidance control processor. Again, public information. So now that I know who makes the guidance control processor, what I had to do, we had to figure out exactly how to either influence it or rewrite the stupid thing. At this point, we have to give thanks to Walter. Walter worked for the company that made these things. Walter was also a very nice thing who actually designed the acronym that goes with the Pac-3 missile. He also programmed the programmable modules, and he did the whole thing in Cordic, to which I actually hate him, because I had to learn Cordic programming. But we also, thanks to him, figured out exactly what the field programmable arrays were, how the switch sandwiches work, and how the actual architecture worked. This is all out there if you want to try and find it. It's quite fun. So now we have the ability to influence it, architect it, rebuild it, reprogram it, the whole bloody lot. What we didn't know is how to actually you know, get it to interact. So thankfully, some bright spark in a third party of a third party posted the entire DOD standards online for exactly how to make these things communicate including all the switch matrix system, the architecture, the capabilities, etc., etc. So now we pretty much so own every single thing there is about the capabilities around these damn missiles, as demonstrated here. We have the whole thing. So what we needed to do is go make friends with the company. So we did. They have an FTP site, and their FTP site is wide open. And unfortunately, it had some of the actual designs for the guidance control chips. So in good-spirited citizens, we downloaded the damn things. <laughs> we rewrote the guidance control architecture for the guidance system. By the way, there's more than one of these damn chips on these bloody things. There's about a hundred of the damn things. It took a lot of rewriting. But eventually, when we gave it back to the people and said, test this, it didn't matter what coordinates they put in. They went straight to the coordinates we'd already hard-coded into the program. Score one for the bad guys. So in doing so, we also made friends with some other countries' um, Patriot missile systems and other installations of other missiles, which we then gave to other people and said, hey, look, they've got missiles too, and there's their data. And then we figured out where the Patriot missiles were. And then we figured out how to deploy the Patriot missiles that we needed. By the way, we figured out how far those damn things fly, and to make them go to the target we needed, we needed to keep most of them inside the US, which is a bit of a problem. So we have missiles. And there are various things you can actually do with them, needless to say. By the way, I will give a thanks out to all of those people inside corporations who download free antivirus, especially ones who run around with classified computers and still download free antivirus. We love you and your data. Thanks, Brainbox. So how are we doing time-wise? I have absolutely no clue. We're good on time, aren't we? Sweet. All right, so now we start messing around. This is where, this is where um, I had to take a few of the slides out, but we can talk about some stuff. So this is where we decided we needed power. And we couldn't use the nuclear power that was coming out of Denver because, well, it was kind of old. We needed new power. And we obviously need a lot of power in our evil genius lab. 
because we've got to do missiles, we've got to do computers and storage arrays and trains. We obviously need more missiles because obviously we need lots of defensive situations. So literally sitting at um, IHOP one evening, we figured out that there's some new nuclear power stuff that's being designed. The problem is, is they take the damn things and they put them in submarines. But they're self-contained units. And they go for 33 years. So it's like an ever-ready ever battery that runs for 33 years. And it runs in a megawatt range. The problem is they put them in submarines. So you've got to get the damn things out of a submarine. Big tin opener. Or you have to borrow the submarine. So we decided to pick on what's known as the S9G. You can do some research on this. It's sitting in the Virginia class reactor. It powers the submarines. There's quite a few of them out there, and they're quite fun. Um, steady output, steady research, and I can't present the whole lot about the, how to catch your own submarine. We can talk a little bit about it, but I can't put everything out on this. Needless to say, because I got yelled at. What we can tell you is the research you need to do. Top left-hand side is the possible location that maybe some of this actually comes out of. Now, I would highly recommend when you're looking at this organization, you look at the subsidiaries and also the owning co ownership company. Again, do your research. Do your OSINT research. Start looking at the organizations and what emails they're putting out. By the way, when you're looking at the third party company and you look at their emails, there is a distinct possibility you might still find the FTP site. The FTP site still has a whole bunch of data, including FTP user IDs and passwords. We love them for this because it gave us access to other areas that we needed. The other areas that we are allowed to actually get to, or that we actually managed to get to, was this nice little one down here. It's a nice little website that tells you exactly where the reactor is, what it's doing, how it is, and some of the controlling interfaces. Because what I eventually figured out was you can't just take a nuclear reactor, put it down there, and hook up a set of jumper cables. Jesse told me I can't do that. I have to get a little bit more sophisticated than that. So what we ended up doing was looking at the reactor and then started looking at the software components around it. Again, I need my power and I need good clean power for the data array for the missile production systems. And again, I have to find out through digital footprinting, through open source gathering, exactly how to control the reactor. You can actually go out to Google and do some of this. You don't actually even have to have the engine. If you go out to the Tor network and the Onion network, you can even find out a whole lot more about it. So now I have my reactor. It's in a submarine, which is a pain in the ass. Um, I have the architecture for the system. I have the software for the system. And I know how the thing works. We actually found one that's sitting on land that they test that's a long way from the ocean, um, which is kind of ironic, because right where one of the most geologically unsafe areas is in this country, slightly to the left of it on a map, is one of the biggest nuclear testing areas. I'll let you guys figure out where that is. But right in the middle of there, they have a reactor that they test on these damn things. Needless to say, if you're really clever, you can actually get remote shell on the uh, cooling plant system for it. They've got a demo of it, bless their cotton socks. <sighs> so, we still have the minions to solve, and I haven't quite figured this one out yet. I don't know how to actually solve the problem with the minions. I've got an idea. There was a conference that happened last year with RFID tagging. They tagged everybody and they knew exactly where everybody went. So I'm like, okay, we could do that. You can do social engineering. Hi, we have some projects for you. Come in, build these missiles. They're really good things. There's all sorts of things. You can make a corporation and give it a normal corporate world. There's disinformation. There's R&D. Most of us would probably enjoy working in an evil lair. Although there'd be this damn power struggle every bloody week because each one of us would want to be the boss. We could take it in turns. But simply, all joking aside, we are literally looking at internal data leakage. The problem is DLP's not going to find it. Your IDS, your IPS, and your firewall sure as hell will ignore it. How do you guys deal with it? How do you control it and how do you manage it? And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to highlight some of the challenges. We're obviously having a lot of fun along the way while we're doing it, but we're trying to help organizations understand that, hey guys, you are leaking crap loads of data. You are leaking enough data that I can take over a bloody Patriot missile, for crying out loud. Your business partners, those that do business with you, 
are leaking data. The vendors, the organizations that you love and trust and hand money over for people and services are leaking data about you. There's some slides I didn't put up there. We worked with a, one of our clients hosts a bunch of data at a data, hosts a bunch of their systems at a data center. So we socially engineered the data center. Then they handed over config systems, database schemas, the whole bloody lot for that client and for a whole bunch of other clients. Easy done. From a pen testing standpoint, this stuff's a gold mine. From a blue team and an internal organization standpoint, you guys have to be more aware and more cognizant that this is going on. Obviously, the deliberately removal of data is the controlling of data. How do you manage and how do you control the data you have? <sighs> so the shopping list. Obviously, the wheels we sorted, the buses we sorted, the planes we sorted, the boats we have now sorted. The missiles, I think we will agree we've probably sorted the missiles. We actually tested um, in a controlled environment exactly the code that we would put on the guidance control chips, and it worked. So the missile went where we wanted it to, not where they programmed it to. So I think we got missiles sorted. The power, we kind of got sorted as well. I had to cut that one short, and for that I apologize. Let's just say we have the capability to get to the submarine. We have the capability to take control of the nuclear system on the submarine. And we have the ability to take some of the power off the submarine. When the damn thing's in dock. The problem is, I live in Colorado. It was pointed out to me that it's a landlocked state. I'm not used to that. I come from the United Kingdom, which has water all the bloody way around it. We park our submarines in a lake up in Scotland. We leave them up in Scotland because if the buggers blow up, in theory, it shouldn't affect the United Kingdom too much. They'll just be wee we got the wee Scots guy in here as he left. They'll just be wee hairy radioactive Scottish people very, very angry again. Over here, I can't park a sodding submarine in Colorado. Neither can I take the nuclear part out of the submarine because I didn't realize this until afterwards. The thing weighs about 2,500 tons. Moving that with a tractor would be a bit of a challenge. Now, the fun thing about that one is if you do your research on nuclear reactors, there's actually a company in Colorado which, in their own words, is making a reactor about the size of a bathtub. I'm like, sweet. And again, if I wanted the data from that, how easy is it for me, without breaking into them, to take their information, to gain access to it? How much data has that particular client leaked of their intellectual property? In the case of these guys, quite a lot, unfortunately. We didn't talk about location. I actually forgot to put the slides in for this one, but it's totally cool. If you go online and Google, Google missile sites for sale, there's some totally cool ones. So we already have the missile located. There's actually one in Denver that's really cool. And there's an old radio frequency one that's got like 45,000 square foot underground, completely sorted out, no mess in it or anything else like that. So we have the evil layer sorted out. Again, the problem is Colorado, landlocked state, can't get a bloody submarine in there. We'll figure out. We're working on this one. We've got to figure this one out. Obviously, the minions. We haven't sold the minions. I cannot put a job ad up on Craigslist or up on Monster saying wanted. Actually, I probably could. That'd be fun. <laughs> I take that back. If you see an advert on Monster in a couple of weeks' time, wanted minions, crying out loud, don't respond. <laughs> the other two things on this one. The superhero defense list. Obviously, as every evil genius knows, there's a sodding superhero all the way around the corner. Somewhere out there, and I've got, I think it's like Nick Shapiro's got a, got a list out there of the 100 things I would do if I was an evil genius. I'll post it. Before I, if I give these out, before I give these out, I'll actually put the link on there. It's freaking hilarious. I will not give my minions like blacked out screens. The hero will not be allowed to live for 24 hours while I taunt him. His ass will be shot or tasered on sight. You know, all the normal things you would expect. OSINT. The one other thing that we need as we are crawling and taking the web, and we've realized this one, we have the engine that we have has about half a billion or so websites and URLs and IRC channels that it watches. So if at any point in time you decide to start talking about nuclear fission or fusion or stuff, for God's sakes, please do it on an IRC channel that's encrypted that we're not watching. Please. We have a 
about a half a billion records in the system that we have. So we're closing in on a petabyte's worth of data at the moment. That's indexed in band, and we have some fairly fun kind of fuzzy stuff that goes with it. So I have, what time is it? Does anybody know what the hell the time is? Cool, all right. So from a standpoint of everything else, I actually don't, I didn't have the other one in here. The other legal stuff actually has better language in there. It says if you decide to go take over a missile or a bus or a train, you're doing so at your own risk, have at it and play nice. But that, from a general point of view of the talk, that's it on the talk, guys. Questions or thoughts or anything else like this? Questions? Come on. We've talked about Mr. Yes. Can I access the CAN? I'm going to repeat the question, not because I'm daft, but because nobody else can hear it. So can I access the CAN in a vehicle when the vehicle is off? No, I cannot. So the vehicle, sorry, the vehicle has to have the ignition turned on, and there needs to be power to the entertainment system. Um, I am aware, but I haven't had a chance to play with it yet, that there are a couple of technologies deployed in vehicles that allow, how should we say, remote access. One of them has something to do with celestial things. Um, we haven't yet had chance to play with that, but it's on the radar. I just need time, the resources, and a spare vehicle that I can take back to Hertz without them looking at me all confused again, because I broke shit on it. Um, <laughs> should said organization decide to lend me one of their vehicles that has this celestial thing on it, we'll more than happily take it and see if we can break it. But yeah, that's the only way at the moment I know that you could mess with it. Good question, though. There was another one. I saw another hand shoot up. There is. <laughs> um, yeah, those are fun. I got into trouble for playing with the space station. Shit, what was that? Seven, eight, nine years. How many years ago was that? Crap. Eight, nine years ago, we messed around with a space station. We adjusted the temperature on it. It was quite fun. We got yelled at by NASA. If they're going to leave open shit that's not encrypted, that's their own damn silly fault. <laughs> um, so satellites. I, you, oh, there's so many things to play with out there. This is just having time. So we have a couple of clients that have things up in the air. What we have found is the easiest way to take those things over is actually to take over the ground control systems and then mess with obviously the communication architecture. Because the communication architecture itself, for the most part, and if any of you know better in here, for the most part it's fairly well encrypted or is pretty well segregated or separated off from anything else. And if anybody argues with that, I have no problem going mere culpa on that one. But the ones that we've dealt with, we found the easiest way, and literally it is the easiest way, is to physically either get into the location or electronically get into the location and then take control of the ground systems. Because they have the sodding great big gobbling dishes and all the other stupid shit. And if I, if I have those in my evil lair, no problem. I got it, because you can actually steal the passwords and have fun with the controlling systems. But until I have that, I'm actually going to use their technology because it's cheaper and easier. But that's as much as we've played with those things. Um, yeah, those would be fun to play with even more. I, that's a good one. We might have to come back next year and see how many satellites we can actually take control of. <laughs> I, <laughs> you support that idea. Great, I'm going to get yelled at again. Um, I, I mean, does anybody here mess around with satellites? All right, your homework for the next 12 months. <laughs> see who can fuck with the most satellites. <laughs> Yes, good question though, but yeah, expect that to be in next year's, if I get invited back if Chris doesn't shoot me again. Yeah. Take, which, who, oh, the, <laughs> we tried, <laughs> we tried, we've already, <laughs> somebody put, so, I, do you guys catch it? The Curiosity rover that's bouncing around Mars like a, a rabid freaking crazed RV at the moment. The suggestion was to take that for a spin. We've actually started to investigate that, shall we say? Again, this, go, this goes back to OSINT. This goes back to intel. People, we as humans, we like to stand there and go, hey, I did this cool shit. That's fine, but stop giving so much data away. We as humans and as organizations like to say, hey, we did all this cool stuff. 
I already said it, Boeing gets all these companies and then all the companies go, woohoo, we're building airplanes for Boeing. They become the targets, no different than our Curiosity Rover thing. There are organizations out there that have publicly gone, hey, we are building shit for this thing. We have done this, we have the controlling interfaces, we have the architecture for this. The closest we've done is figure out exactly how they're communicating, how they're controlling it, and we might have one or two of the passwords for some of the software that we know are still in default mode, but the problem is, is actually getting into it without breaking more laws than we're used to breaking. No, I think NASA would probably really get pissed at me for that one. We start, I'd really want to give it a figure of eight if we could do. We were trying to do that with the drones. So we have, the, we have University of Texas uh, disclose some stuff, I think it was before DEF CON this year, where they took the drones and they managed to fly it through a prerequisite path and they were messing around with GPS and stuff like that. We've actually got ADSB now so that we can actually mess, render and I'd be messing around with this. And he, he did a whole bunch of stuff at DEF CON this year. But we've now got the ADSB where we can start to ghost signals around the drones. So we can actually start to move the drones where they don't want to go. But I haven't got it developed fully enough that I want to put it up on screen and present the damn thing yet. Because what I really want to do is have one do a figure of eight. Just for the sheer giggles of it. Questions? Yeah. Cool. Well, the hobbyists have got a ton of satellites out there, yeah. Nice. All right, so it's a matter of just, it's, it's no different. And, and I'll pick on the car stuff, and I'll pick on some of the other things. I mean, there is a ton of data out there if you want to start doing the research on. Same thing with the ADSB. The military, I think it was the civvies. The civvies actually produced a white paper. I think it was actually co-authored with the military produced a white paper a couple of years ago stipulating exactly how many flaws and security holes there were in ADSB. They published the damn thing. I think it's publicly available. It is, well, we, can, we, we found it. How about that way? Um, I think it's publicly available. Try. It'll be an interesting experiment. But it's out there. And it goes through like 10, 15 different flaws in ADSB. That's like a cookbook for crying out loud. So I would imagine the satellite thing would probably be something similar. It's like, OK, this is my target. What are, the, what are the vectors? And you're right, the hobbyists have got a ton of those things up there. You start flying them into each other. <laughs> yeah, you get yelled at by a few people. No, that's a good, yeah, I mean, that would be cool. Yeah. I don't mind. Go for it. Uh, 